I mean, I was a political activist first before I became a lawyer. And for me, uh, when we all train as lawyers, we often dream about being involved in cases which will make history. So, of course, when I saw what happened on October the 1st, first of all, I couldn't believe when I saw what the Spanish police or the Spanish state were doing to the Catalan people because we thought that this is the sort of things that happened in Africa, in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia and other countries, not in mainland Europe. So when I was told that there was a warrant for Clara Pensati's arrest and I was asked to represent her, I immediately said yes, it was unconditional. But very quickly I realized that we were on the international stage, we had an opportunity we were watching history being made, but we also had an opportunity to mold history because we were talking about the principles that we are taught in law school, the principles I know as a political activist I've spent most of my lifetime fighting for, for justice, for freedom, for equality. And what I've learned over the years is that those things are not given to you on a plate in a courtroom. It's people that have given their lives fighting for it. And we're lucky in the United Kingdom and I suppose to a certain extent lucky in Spain that they don't have the death sentence. But for me to see a woman who has dedicated her life to Catalonia, to academia, to be threatened with 33 years imprisonment for doing what? For being an education minister? For wanting the right to vote? For wanting to express the will and the aspirations of the Catalan people? That was a disgrace. It was almost like a death sentence because 33 years in prison, it's a very long time, and most people I know at that age when they go into prison, I know Clara wouldn't like me to say this because she argued with me, she said, I'll, I'll still be alive. But we knew we were fighting for her life, and we were fighting for the life, and all of us as lawyers knew that we are fighting for people's lives. Even one day in the prison is too much. Um, they have been in prison now for over a year. And the exiles, of course, wake up every day, and they... I mean, Clara sends her best wishes. She sends her love. She wants to be sat where I'm sat now. You know, she wants to come home. So we haven't won yet. We won the first battle. We haven't won the war. But um, very much, yes, it was the case of my life because for me, I've never known, I said to you earlier on, I've never known anywhere else in the world that I've called home apart from Glasgow. But to me now, Barcelona, Catalonia is a second home. I always feel like I'm coming home. Um, and that very much is to do with this case, is to do with the people. And I keep referring back. I say it to the politicians, I say it to the government ministers, I say it to your president. I say, you have the power, you have the opportunity to change history, to have freedom, to do all those things that for 300 years that people have dreamed about. And that power rests with the people. And it's the people of Catalonia that I've fallen in love with. First of all, it was a real honor I'd been in Barcelona a year before and I was invited by the UCE and I said to speak in Prades, the universities and they'd asked me to come as rector and of course I was in the city on the 17th of August last year when the terrorist attack happened and um, I walked through the streets, I walked through the Ramblers it was a beautiful afternoon and I looked down and I thought what an amazing city you could see a sea of humanity you could see black, white, gay straight Muslim, non-Muslim, every religion, no religion. And I was about to sit down and um, have something to eat. And the waiter came up, gave me the menu, and then I thought, it's too hot. And I remembered my son had cried before I'd left because he wanted to come. And I said, uh, and I said to my son before I left Glasgow, I said, well, I'll get you whatever you want. Tell me what you want. And he said he wanted a, a Barcelona football kit. So I got up, and I thought, I'll go and get the kit first, and then I'll get something to eat. And just at that point, I heard the screams and the shouts, and I turned around, and everybody was running. And it was hundreds and thousands of people running. And I ran, it must have been, it seemed like ages, but probably only 30 seconds until I came to stop. And when I came to stop, I turned around and looked, and I could see a mother screaming, a child, a, youngest, a young child who's two, same age as my youngest one, pulling, screaming, came mama, mama, the woman was crying. And then I, the police were all there um, with their guns and pushing all this back. And then I realized she's lost her children. And the policeman burst into tears. I burst into tears. And I remember the next day I went to Prada. As I said, no, I still want to carry on the conference. But that morning, the following morning, I went back to the Ramblers at the spot where there was the van. I'd stop and the van was gone. And I remember taking a photograph of a single flower somebody put down. This was at 6 o'clock in the morning. 
And when I went to Plaza de Catalonia, and then I saw everybody was saying, no tingue po. And I didn't know, but I was amazed, because I looked around and I thought, oh, looked at all the Catalan people there standing in unity, and the same sea of humanity, and they've said, we'll not be divided, we're not scared. And of course, when I went to Pradas, when I went back to that spot, it was thousands and thousands of flowers. And I, when I went to the conference the next day, I remember saying to Anna Arquez from UCE, who was here, and Ali Sande, the president of the ANC, and said, look, if there's anything I can ever do to help, I want to come back. So I was supposed to come back on the 1st of October, but because I was involved in the court case, I couldn't. Bertrand Shamawick, who was the president of the presiding office of the Scottish Parliament, and a number of other friends came back. And I watched in horror when I saw what, to me, looked like fascist boot boys attacking an innocent people who were expressing their right to vote. And I was horrified. And so, of course, when I got the call from, from Trisha saying, can you represent Clara? I said, absolutely. It was an honor. I thought this is my chance to give something back. And then when we saw the charges, at first there was disbelief because we thought rebellion, rebellion with violence, embezzlement. And the rebellion with violence, when we saw the charge, went, what rebellion with violence? The only rebellion I saw that day was the police officers who broke what we know police officers all around the world swear an oath to protect the public, to be the guardians of law and order. And yet what I saw was violence perpetrated by a state on an innocent people. So for me, when I saw that, we said, and I remember speaking to Nicola Sturgeon, our first minister, and saying to her at the time, saying, this is almost like, Nicola, if tomorrow you called a referendum to say Scotland wants to be independent. And Theresa May, our Prime Minister, sent 15,000 police officers to batter everyone, to stop them, um, you know, expressing the right to vote. There would be total horror. But this is what the Spanish are doing to the Catalans. And then if Nicola was thrown into prison, half the government was thrown into prison, and the other half went into exile, people would think that's crazy. I remember at the time we used the words, why are they doing this? And some people said, and I said, it's because they're being crazy. And then eventually within the first week and then the second week when we started to examine, we went, this doesn't make sense. When we looked at the paperwork, even in terms of legal language, there were so many mistakes. And we didn't see one scrap of evidence against Clara Ponsetti for how she had organized a rebellion. Because it takes an organization, a conspiracy of everybody uniting with each other. And I thought, I've not seen, I'd seen the same TV pictures, I'd seen the same um, press conferences, I'd seen the same newspapers, and we couldn't find one scrap of evidence to say she had organized a rebellion. And of all the politicians, including the two Geordies, and all the rest of them, when I looked into them, I thought, all these people were peaceful. All they ever asked for was peacefully, for people to act peacefully. And they have continued to do so, despite the, the atrocities, despite the persecution. And I stood up and I went very quickly within the, probably the first 48 hours of reading the paperwork, I went, this is a political persecution political prosecution, which I then described as a political persecution, I said, then the only way to fight this is to fight it politically with a legal strategy, which means not just in the courtroom, but outside because people are fighting for their lives. And the Spanish judiciary has to be exposed for what they are doing to these people, um, because if we don't, then we lose. Um, we have to fight it that way, and we have to bring the Spanish government, the ministers into the courtroom, we have to expose them every step of the way. And I, I realized very quickly, as soon as I started saying this, because we said, we value free speech. We have a right to speak out, right to say this. And then I saw some of the attacks from the media, the Spanish media on, on me. It's like they were outraged. And even when I mentioned the ghost of Franco, which I continued to do, and I was surprised. And then I remember speaking to Clara, I said, this is almost like Franco, his ghost, is dictating the tune to the Spanish state. He must be, he must be cheering from his grave in terms of what is happening today, because it's almost everybody's following in his footsteps. Um, so for me, it, it was a great honor, but it was a great test as well for all our legal team. All our legal team had to learn very fast and very quickly within the space of a month, we realized none of us could believe what Spain was doing in the name of justice in a, in a European country. And when we looked at the European leaders, their complicity with silence, failing to speak out, there's no point in speaking out against Russia. There's no point in speaking out against Saudi Arabia. No point in speaking out against countries in Africa when you won't even speak out against a country on your own doorstep that has abused human rights, that has abused the concept of freedom, that has tried to criminalize people's opinions, their right for freedom of association, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, one after another, every single human right being abused, and then to punish them and say, we will decapitate your government 
Because what they mean is we'll send your politicians to prison or we'll send them into exile so that we can silence you as a people. Um, so it was a very important case and that's why I said that it, it, it's almost like you people are making history, but you're teaching the rest of the world peacefully how to respond. But I really do think that time is not on our side. Yes, the warrants have been withdrawn, but the strategy still remains and I think there's lessons to be learned in terms of how the Spanish reacted because they were scared. They didn't like the international strategy. And I think some of those lessons should now be applied to what is happening in January when the case starts. Because otherwise it'll be too late. I come here every month. I'm here every three or four weeks now. And every time I come, I speak to the politicians. I speak to everybody else and they say, they say what do you think we should do? And I say, well, you're the politicians. You make the decision. You were elected. You were given the mandate for independence. You decide what to do. You lead from the front. Your colleagues are in prison. You must do something now. In January, the trial starts. It will be in Madrid. These people will be put on trial. Their lives are being destroyed. They will be exhausted. You must use your power. And your power is not parliament. Your power is the people on the streets who want something to be done, not to be humiliated once again by the Spanish. I, I just want to finish that off by just saying that when you look at the history, the Spanish, I've said it before, and I think I said it in the book as well, that the Spanish are just like the British. The British Empire was the most bloodthirsty empire on the planet. And they learned the, the tradition of divide and rule and to delay when anybody wanted freedom. Oh, we'll, we'll give you this, but we need to be reasonable. You need to do this and, um, and, and delay and delay and delay. And they always hoped that the independence movements in all these countries would be split. And that's what they're doing now. And when you look at your history, 12 of your presidents, 11 of them, 11 of them jailed, exiled, or executed. Fair enough. They're not doing executions now. Maybe some of them still want to do the executions. Um, but jailed or exiled, they are repeating the same picture. Again, the only way you will beat the Spanish and get independence is if you do not repeat the same mistakes and fall into the same traps, which means you cannot recognize the legitimacy of the Spanish state. The Spanish state has acted illegally. It's not the Catalans that have acted illegally. It's the Spanish that have broken international rule of law. And that means it's now for the Catalans to say enough is enough. Yes, we have a strategy and a battle to fight in the courtroom, but we also have a strategy to fight outside that courtroom, and it has to be independence. I agree with everything that was just said there. Um, and it's been my concern for some time, um, watching as an outsider, what is going on here. And I said it at the Diada, and I'll say it again. I said, when Pedro Sanchez came in, people in England and Scotland said, oh, it's a socialist. Come in, I was like, going, I said, it's socialist maybe in Spain, but right-wing Francoism when it comes to Catalonia. Um, no different, no different. And I said at the Diada, I said that when you look at what Spain is doing, and Pedro Sanchez, and he said he wanted a political solution rather than a judicial solution. I said, what the government of Spain is doing, and I don't differentiate, I don't care if it was Rajoy, I don't care if it was Sanchez, I don't care who it is, because they're all the same. Because they were, what I said was that it is like when a gangster would invade Pedro Sanchez's house and take his wife and his children hostage and hold a gun to their head and then stay in that house, not for one day, not for two days, not for three weeks, but for one year. And at the end of the one year, to say to Pedro Sanchez, the gangster says, now will you sit down, have a cup of tea with me? Will you negotiate? about me leaving the house, you would say that, I said, that's not negotiation. That's terrorism. That's state terrorism. And what you have in a country in the heart of Europe is political hostages, political prisoners, and that is unacceptable, which means that if you accept that they are political hostages, that they are political prisoners, then Spain has abused the very concept of justice and that means you should be prepared for what Spain will do next. They are trying to repeat history. They did it to 11 out of 12 of your presidents. And the only solution you have is this, and I keep saying it to my friends in Catalonia, stop looking to us for the solution. Stop looking to Europe for the solution. 
the European leaders will do nothing to help you until you help yourself. And the power rests with the Catalan people. <laughs> and whilst there has to be the strategy for the trial, there has to be the international strategy, it is an important as we just said, it's an important process to go to, to go to the European Court of Human Rights, to win this battle. As lawyers for us, we want to take it right to the end. We want to win. We want to show what Spain has done. But are the politicians going to then turn around and say at the end of the trial, oh, we need to wait another year. We need to wait another two years. We need to wait another three years because we've got to go through the process. That's the trick that Spain is playing. That's what they want to happen. You cannot wait for the court process to finish in Europe. You have to fight now. And I said, when I went with um, Quim Tora to see the prisoners in La Donna um, a few weeks ago, I, when they asked me the question, the two Geordies and the, the rest of the prisoners, political prisoners said to me, so what do you think? And I said to them openly, I said, with respect, I said, you will only be free when Catalonia is independent. That is what I believe. Because the Spanish will not, the Spanish state Franco's Spanish state, the one he gave birth to, will not allow these individuals the freedom to be able to walk the streets, to be able to do any of that. And that will only come as a result of Catalonia deciding for itself that we want our freedom, and that means you have to fight a parallel strategy. There has to be the strategy in the courts, but it is about time that the strength that we saw in the Diada, the one and a half million people, is used by the politicians, by the people in this country, by the media, whoever it is, to get them out on the street and say that we want independence. Those same people, stop looking to Angela Merkel, stop looking to Theresa May, she's got her own bloody problems, um, but I mean, stop looking to, to these people for, as though somehow the solution. For me, the most striking images of where your freedom lies was on October the 1st. Because you saw young people, and often we, we can sometimes be, I'm not that young now, but we can be patronized and you always think, oh, the young have the spirit of dissent. It's the young people that will fight. It's the young people that win. Well, actually, no. Because since I've been in this country, whether it was at the Diada, the people who were in their 80s and 90s who hugged me and were tears in their eyes and told me about the torture, about the disappearances, about what Franco did to their families, and those same people who went on the Zimmer frames with their walking sticks, took the batons, beating, bleeding, etc., and said, no, we will vote. We will vote for our children's children's future. That is what you have a chance of making history. And it is about time that that is utilized and that a strategy has been placed because time is too short. Otherwise, you miss that moment, then you'll be waiting another 20 or 30 years.